The cloudless blue sky was split open by swirling, glowing light. Raja, Damien, Akan, Liam, and Sydney were thrown out of the portal and onto the rocky beach. Lying flat on their backs, they groaned with bumps and bruises. Damien struggled to his feet. I'm pretty sure this journey has made me hurt in places I didn't think possible was po what I, th I didn't think was possible to get hurt. Akan laughed only because he didn't want to cry in front of the new people. The group got to their feet and took in their new surroundings. Where are we now, Liam, and Liam asked. Raja shielded his eyes from the relentless sun and scanned the horizon. The sea behind them lapped against the rock. The beach quickly changed into a grassland. There was nothing but tall, dry grass as far as the eye could see. There was no noise indicating life, not even a breeze. The travelers determined to explore, and after several hours of wandering, they came back together to assess their options. Akan came close to Raja, a frown evident on his face. He brushed some sand out of his hair. There's nothing, nobody here. Damien rubbed his dry lips with the back of his palm. No food, no water. We are going to die here. Respa will guide us, Raja said trying so hard not to sound like he was doing nothing but repeating himself over and over. Damien folded his arms, glaring at Raja. Well, I haven't particularly cared for his guidance so far. Akan looked longingly at the sea behind him. He'd come so far and the thought of traveling through yet another island was almost too much for him. He licked his dry lips. Raja looked across the empty horizon again and set his jaw. He pulled out his compass and checked it. The compass isn't giving us anything. So we'll rest, watch and wait patiently. At the proper time, we will act. The sun set showing a spectacular array of colors. They took some much needed sleep and they needed to prepare for this next island and Raja wanted to be well rested for it. The next day, the sun once again beat down on their heads. Damien wiped sweat from his brow as they gathered their things together to begin the journey. Akan swallowed dryly, rubbing his throat. Liam wrung his water skin flask with all his might and only got a little drizzle. Raja gave his flask to Sydney, Sydney, encouraging her to drink what was left. She gave him a grateful smile as she finished it. Raja sat cross-legged in the sand and then pulled out his compass to check it again. We go west. Our guide is waiting for us. Damien stood up and brushed himself off. I'm not doubting the compass, Raja, but have you ever thought of following the beach around the island? Then we can skip whatever horrors may be inside. I ask you to follow me. If you choose to stay, I will try to bring you back food, Raja said. Sydney followed Raja without hesitation. Liam got to his feet and stumbled after them. Damien warned Akan with his eyes to stay with him. Akan hesitated and then left with Raja, urging Damien with a nod of his head. Damien scowled, knowing he'd rather not stay on one of these islands by himself and hurried to catch up. The party walked cautiously through the thick, tall grass. Watch out for snakes, Damien spit out sullenly as he walked past Akan. A look of horror darted across Akan's face. He kept his gaze down on the ground, stepping through the grass like it was threatening to burst into flames at the slightest touch. He wanted to start running out of the grass in order to get to safety, but grass was the only thing he could see. We need to get out of this sun. It's starting to get so hot and I need some shade, Akan said as he wiped his brow. We're going to boil alive if we're not careful. We'll be fine, Raja said. Respa, Respa will provide, Damien and Akan both finished for Raja, sounding unimpressed. Come now, Liam said, frowning. Respa has already done so many things. Raja has the compass and the compass is a magnificent gift. Damien was about to retort when Raja laughed and pointed ahead of them. There, a tree. The sun reflected off the leaves of a tree growing in the distance. About time, Damien said. They traveled through the hot sun, the thought of shade, the only thing keeping them going. They weren't quite sure what they'd find at the shade, but a change of scenery was enough to keep Damien interested. A few yards shy of the tree, they saw an enormous rhino enjoying his breakfast. 
Damien, wide-eyed, admired the smooth curve and sharp point of the horn adorning the top of the animal's nose. Look at that beauty. Worth a small fortune, he surmised. He instinctively pulled the knife from his belt and crouched slightly, beginning to creep towards the rhino. A con reached out to pull him back. Surely his friend wouldn't be stupid enough to go after a rhino on these crazy islands. However, as Akan reached out, Damien was just out of reach to stop him, and Akan was too terrified to say anything. The animal might turn on them, and it would be better if he didn't make a show of himself. He watched with terrified wonder as Damien went closer to the grazing beast. Damien, don't, Raju whispered when he surmised Damien's intent. The rhino caught sight of Damien out of the corner of his eye and turned to face him. At a closer range, with the huge horn a dozen feet away from his face and the piercing look from the rhino directed between his own eyes, Damien decided to change his plan. The rhino snorted, his head dropped. The two sized each other up for a moment before the rhino began to charge. Dropping the dagger, Damien turned and ran as fast as he could in the direction of his friends, he wondered if he could outrun the rhino, but he knew it was a ridiculous notion. How could he have been so foolish? Why hadn't Akan stopped him? Raja grabbed Damien and threw him to the ground and attempted to put himself between him and the horn to no avail. Hands raised to the rhino, Raja shouted as Damien rolled spectacularly over and over, his arms covering his face. Please, we're looking for the guardians of this island. We mean you no harm. Raja entreated the animal with all the energy he could muster, hoping that he would understand. The rhino stopped its charge, kicking up dirt just as Damien stopped rolling. The horn stopped inches from Damien's nose, which was barely poking out between his fingers. The rest of the party crouched, covering their heads with their arms for protection and coughing on the dust. The rhino squinted, staring momentarily at the sniveling Damon, and then huffed. Damien felt the hot air from the rhino on his face, a gentle reminder of what could have been a deadlier outcome. If you would attempt to take my horn, you are not welcome here, the rhino said, staring directly into Damien's eyes. What are you saying? Speak so the rest of us can understand, Damien said. The rhino huffed again and Damien closed his eyes from the onslaught of hot air in his face. Damien swore he saw the rhino smirking. As I thought, his greed and fear deafen his ears, the rhino said. Damien glanced from Raja to the rhino. Raja, translation, please. Please forgive us, Raja bowed his head and extended his hand, palm up. He might translate for Damien later. Right now, he was more interested in seeking forgiveness from the rhino, whose deadly horn was inches away from skewering them all. I am Raja. These are my friends, Sydney, Liam, Akan, and Damien. The rhino finally turned his head away from Damien and looked at Raja, his eyes immediately soft. Damien took the opportunity to scramble to a standing position and then back away as silently as he could. May we know your name? Raja asked. I am Ko. Ko, we had nothing to drink for two days. Do you know where we can find some fresh water? Raja pleaded. Damien watched the interchange pensively. He watched Raja carry on a conversation with this rhino, even though it appeared like all that the rhino was doing was huffing and snorting. He wondered what he was saying. If he hadn't gone through many islands of talking animals, he would have thought Raja to be a lunatic. However, instead, he felt a quiet shame within himself for what he'd done. I can lead you to fresh water, but the journey will be dangerous. You must protect yourself with armor as my tough skin protects me, Ko said. Damien, Damien's foot fell on top of a fallen branch and it snapped in two. Ko turned and stared in Damien's direction and once again huffed. Damien felt a familiar irritation rise inside him. Could someone please tell me what's going on? He asked. Raja subdued his internal exasperation with Damien and translated as best he could while Ikan, Liam and Sydney started to cut out shields from the bark of the tree. Ko watched them carefully and offered pointers where he saw they needed some extra help. Damien worked as soon as he got the translation back from Raja. He knew Akan, Raja, and this new group wouldn't put him up to a practical joke, but the idea of needing to protect himself from something seemed strange and silly. 
They didn't need this kind of protection before on any other island. He started to miss the days when this Respa creature would have just given them the things they needed. How does a shield of wood protect us from anything, Damien asked. Raja tied the shield to his arm and about answered with his usual answer when he paused and looked at Ko. Ko turned to Damien and took a few steps until once again he was right next to Damien. Damien found himself cursing for want, wanting that stupid horn. Now it was all he could see and he just wanted it out of his face. Raja, Raja, translate, Ko said. Raja nodded and Ko continued. I know the path to the water and I've seen soldiers that wish evil on this island. We need a plan in order to get you safely to the water and that includes protection. I have a thick layer of skin to help me. You have nothing. If you would like to continue to have nothing against these soldiers, you are more than welcome to not make yourself a shield. But if you really want water, I suggest you commit to that shield you're making as though your life depends on it, because it does. Damien swallowed after Raja finished translating for him. He didn't expect such a straightforward answer. It was usually some mythical abstract ideas, but Ko gave it to him without any of that. It would have been a nice change, except for what he was saying made Damien even more terrified, and he quickly went to work getting the protection he needed from the wood. Ko had them practice with their makeshift armor, giving them more suggestions and pointers. It took quite a while, but Raja would rather be alive when he got to the water and pushed past his fatigue. Ko finally nodded his approval and told them to follow close behind them and, and led them across the grassland. It was mostly quiet. Raja heard something in the distance, but after a quick sniff from Ko, he made no other reaction and kept walking. Raja knew it was wise to follow him. The watering hole was in sight, surrounded by a cluster of trees. Raja was willing to drop his shield and head straight for it when Ko stopped and sniffed the air. Ko? Raja asked. Quiet, Ko whispered. He sniffed again and his ears twitched. I don't hear anything, Akan said. It was then that Raja heard it. He couldn't quite understand what it meant, but there was someone or a group of someone by the watering hole waiting to ambush them. Out of the trees dropped a dozen soldiers, all wielding terrifying swords. Raja immediately pulled out his knife. Their swords are so much bigger than our knives. Akan's voice was a few octaves higher than normal. This is going to end so badly. Ko snorted, I can't see that well, so I can't confirm. But there's one thing I can say. The only path to water is to commit to this fight or go back. And if you commit, don't back down for anything. With that, Ko began to charge. Damien couldn't help but feel a touch of empathy as he saw the fear on the soldiers' faces as the rhino came charging toward them. Raja picked up his shield and raced after Ko, his best attempt at his own charging. The others followed soon after. It was clear that soldiers were well-trained with much longer swords, weren't, who were well-trained with much longer swords, weren't actually prepared to see the group charging toward them with such force, especially one that on the surface seemed so ill-prepared. Ko took out three of the soldiers from his charge alone. Raja found himself fighting off two soldiers. Raja felt like it was utter chaos. They fought and jabbed with their knives. Raja tried to forget that a sword was much longer than a knife. He tried to keep in mind that in his hand, as he committed to helping his friends get to the water, a knife was so much better than nothing. Raja tried to stay in front of Sydney to protect her from the two soldiers that he was fighting off. Behind you, Sydney stabbed at a soldier. He yelped and grabbed his arm. Damien's shield cracked and broke. A soldier swiped at Damien's neck and he threw up the last remaining bit of his shield and redirected the blow. Damien screamed in pain as the sword dug into his arm. In an instant, Raja had left the two soldiers to Sydney and tried to get to Damien. The soldier pulled out the sword and lifted it to make the deadly blow. Damien, Raja yelled as the other soldier got in his way. No, seeing their despair, Ko turned and charged toward the soldier. The soldier saw Ko and dropped his sword. He turned and fled. As soon as the first soldier turned and ran, the others did the same. Ko slowed down his charge as the other soldiers scrambled away from the rhino. Ko made a final snort toward the soldiers and lumbered back to the group. Raja rushed to Damien's side and Damien gripped his upper arm. 
blood leaking out between his fingers. How bad is it? Damien asked. Roger pried his fingers away from the wound and he inspected it as best he could. He was no master of medicine, but he did learn a few things. It missed the bone. You're lucky. I thought he got your neck. Damien closed his eyes, trying not to give in to the surprise of seeing so much of his blood on the ground. Deflected the blow at the last second, Co walked up to them and Damien met his eyes. I'm certainly glad I had my shield of wood. Co smiled, it was better than nothing, right? Damien paused, realizing it was the first time he'd been able to understand Co. He actually could talk. Damien didn't know why he felt so relieved at that revelation, but didn't stop himself from laughing. Raja turned to the others, gather some leaves to pack the wound. Liam, Sidney, and Akan rushed to help their friend. Raja, Raja used his hand to apply pressure and stop the bleeding. Am I going to be fine, Damien asked. I wouldn't lie to you about this, Raja said. You're lucky the sword missed the bone. We'll get the wound bound and we can be on our way. And drink some water, Damien said. Yes, right, Raja said. He had almost forgotten his thirst during the battle. But when Damien brought it up again, he felt his thirst come back to him with a dizzying force. Damien's eyes wandered to Ko hovering over him. I don't think I ever thanked you, Damien said. Ko nodded in acknowledgement. You are welcome. You certainly committed yourself to this battle, Damien. Remember what you learned here. Damien noticed Ko's gaze lingered on his eyes with intensity. It wasn't too much more of a walk to the watering hole, which was a blessing. Everyone was so tired and worn out that they needed water quickly. Raja helped Damien kneel at the edge of the water and helped him drink, despite Damien promising that he was perfectly capable of helping himself. Raja made sure Damien was okay before joining the others and drinking greedily. They splashed their forearms face and faces to cool themselves down. Raja leaned against the tree, feeling the exhaustion hit him. He was grateful for the water he could drink and equally grateful that the short battle they had with the soldiers didn't end up in any, didn't end up as deadly as it could have. He opened his eyes to see a group of rhinos gathering together on the other side of the watering hole to drink. So Ko looked over and saw the other rhinos before smiling. He turned to Raja and his small group of travelers. You did well, Ko looked at them all. You gave up all that you had in Yalwuna. You have all endured hunger, thirst, pain, sickness, danger, fought and risked your lives on this journey. And I promise you, it will be worth it. You have demonstrated some commitment. Remember it and continue your journey to its end, Ko said. Raja took or stood and bowed his head again. We are very grateful. Ko made one last look at Damien and Akan. Damien realized he did not wish this departure. It was nice to have a guide who wasn't afraid to tell him what was going on. He had a feeling he wouldn't find that in the other animals here. He focused on the massive horn, grateful his initial plan had been such a failure. You will find food and water just north of here in the marsh. Do not drink from the ground. Look for the spring on the north side of the rocks. Farewell. Ko turned around and walked toward his fellow rhinos with a purpose. As Raja watched Ko walk, he again felt involuntary amazement that such a creature could charge so quickly and with such dedication. He got up, brushed himself off. Let's journey on, store what water we can, and let's find some food. The group traveled in the direction that Ko had directed and soon entered the marsh, feeling a light dew upon their faces. They admired the grass turning greener then closed their eyes to, a, to smell a faint, cool breeze. It was a welcome respite from the parched grassland they seemed to have departed so suddenly. A flock of geese from the parched grass, er, a, a flock of geese glided across a patch of deep blue water next to them. 
They all stopped to gaze at the sight. The sun shone behind the magnificent birds as they made their descent into the tranquil mirror beneath them. Damien looked at his fellow travelers. Raj's lips were dry, his face parched, and his clothes dirty, but his gaze was transfixed upon the birds. Damien thought how Raja had always gotten caught up in stuff like that. He looked at the birds. It was a beautiful sight, but he silently pushed away the inclination to absorb it. Instead, he looked around and unburdened himself of his water flask and backpack. Can we camp here tonight? He interrupted his companion's reverie as he stretched his arms above his head and bent to sit on the grass. The rest of the party turned from gazing at the water to look at Damien's direction. I don't know, do you think we ought to stop so early? Raja asked, squinting into the sun. What are we in a hurry to find, Raja? Damien's irritation dripped from every word. Raja glanced at his friend, surprised at Damien's pettiness. Damien caught Raja's expression and turned away. Well, I'm fine if we stop. I'm exhausted, Akan threw his pack down and bent over to sit on the cool greenery. A perturbed honk had him bouncing back up. A gleaming Canadian goose, Canada goose, waddled up to the men. Please have the good manners not to crush my eggs, the goose honked. The group all looked to where Akan almost sat and saw a nest blanketed by the grass. Akan blushed, embarrassed. I am Baldapa. The goose introduced herself. I expect you are all hungry. Uh, follow me, Valdapa invited. They followed the waddling goose to a picnic made up of large leaves filled with wild rice, cattail roots, watercress, cranberries, blueberries, and nettles. Raja, Sydney, and Liam fell on the food gratefully. Where's the meat? Khan asked sarcastically, and Damien snickered. Their host paused and looked at the two men then with a forbearing gesture, approached them and spoke to them personally. I have something of far greater value, should you desire it, Valdapa offered. She padded back to the nest, a soft golden glow surrounded the goose and she flapped her silken wings wildly. The glow grew lighter and brighter until the men had to shield their eyes. It was over as soon as it had begun. Valdapa's feet cradled five solid gold eggs. All of them were shocked, but Damien and Akan were especially overcome. Damien immediately began walking toward the nest, intending to reach for them. But Valdapa nipped his grasping hand with the beak. Ouch, what was that for? Damien demanded, rubbing the side of the attack. You may have as many of my golden eggs as you can carry. You shall be rich men and rule this island, Valdapa offered. Well, then give them to us, Damien demanded, reaching down again. Valdapa again nipped his hand with vigor. Damien, Raja exclaimed in disbelief and disgust. He walked over and engaged Damien's eye level. What are you doing? Damien, have you so forgotten yourself and common courtesy? Don't you lecture me, Raja, Damien hissed back. Ever since they showed up, he jerked his thumb meaningfully towards Sydney and Liam. You've placed yourself above me and a con. Who do you think you are anyway? You'd be nowhere without us. He jabbed a pointed finger into Raja's chest. Anyway, Akan and I have been talking about it and we're not so sure you even know what you're doing anymore, anymore, Raja, or that you ever did. Damien stopped, momentarily feeling a pain of remorse when viewing Raja's hurt expression. Rather than entertaining it, he shook it off and pushed past Raja to walk toward Akan. We are going to Kaura. Sydney stated simply to the goose after a deafening silence. Valdapa seemed to smile at her with delight and then walked toward Damien and Khan. What do you value most? She inquired and then looked at each traveler one by one in their turn. Her gaze returned to Akan. I don't know, Akan admitted, glancing at the smoldering Damon and shrugging. Valdapa's head cocked as if questioning again and then turned to Liam. I guess I value my family and those who are like my family. Liam nodded to Sydney and she nodded in agreement. Valdapa's gaze moved on to Raja. Peace, happiness, and, and joy, Raja pronounced. Damien, Valdapa asked. They all looked to Damien, anxiously waiting for him to speak, but Damien was gone from his spot. In unison, they noticed that Damien had pulled the satchel off his back 
and was busily putting the golden eggs inside. If you must know, he finished the job and stood the satchel resting down his back. This is what I want. Oops, I missed a couple. Damien, Raja gasped, advancing toward him. Don't touch me, Damien whispered, seething. I've had it with all your talk, Raja. This is what I want. This is what I told you from the beginning I wanted, the treasure in the East. I have found it. I have it, and I will not let it go now. Akan and I are heading back to Yawuna and will live out our days in luxury. Honestly, you ought to abandon this foolish quest and come with us. Damien, Raja's tone took on a slight pleading. Don't do this. Can't we talk about this? Damien rolled his eyes tellingly. I know you'd try this. Look, I am dirty, tired, hungry, and bleeding, and I'm going home. Damien shook his bag of gold. This will give us all we give us everything we have ever wanted. Come on, Akan. Damien turned on his heel away from Raja and began to walk away. He noted Akan's hesitation and stopped. You coming, Akan? He spoke begrudgingly. Akan looked at Raja and then down, considering. Slowly he stood and started following Damien. Thanks for everything, Raja, he muttered, and then straightened and, and turned to Raja intensely. But Damien is right, you know. He turned to address the group. We've been traveling for so long and we're all tired. Let's all take the loot and go home. He darted his thumb in Damien's direction and waited expectantly for a response. Silence followed. Liam gazed back at him with his customary calm. Sydney put her hand on her hip to express her disapproval. You're wasting your time, Akan. I told you how it would be, Damien said. Raja shook his head briefly, looking darkly into Akan's eyes, hoping he would reconsider. Akan's gaze wavered under Raja's steady gaze. Looking down, he stammered and then turned and walked decidedly towards Damien. Wait! You can't just leave. Can't we talk about this? Raja called and would have chased after them. Let them go. Liam stopped Raja with a hand on his shoulder. They've been wanting to do this for a long time. Raja let out a long sigh as his shoulders fell and he wistfully watched the two men stumble away with a heavy pack. He felt that part of him, that he felt that part of him went with them. <sighs> What we value, we desire. And that desire gives us the power to achieve for good or ill. Valdapa's words interrupted his forlorn thoughts as he sat back down on a boulder beside her. Valdapa's uh, soft eyes looked after them until they were gone from sight. Shaking her head, she mused, so much suffering in choosing to value that which is of no worth. Raja couldn't help but raise his eyebrows at her. I agree with you, Valdapa, that Kaura is worth more, but they will be richer than Losapa Los himself with that much gold. His eyes raised sadly in the direction his friends had disappeared, then looked again at Valdapa's small head. Perhaps you're not familiar with the economy of Yawuna. He smiled sadly. I assure you that I am highly familiar. My eggs can never leave this island. Raja's eyes furrowed. Oh no, he stood swiftly looking after them. We've got to tell them. Do not fear, Raja. You will yet meet your friends on this island and they will have the opportunity to choose again. She smiled sweetly. Now come with me and be at peace. I have something very special. She led them to another clearing where there were juicy berries growing on bushes. They each found a spot to sit in and in the clearing and ate the delicious berries. As they ate, they felt comforted and Valdapa continued to speak. Your desire has been tested and proven strong. If it remains so, you will all finish your journey alive and well. Raja nodded his head thoughtfully. Valdapa waddled close to each traveler to say her goodbyes. When she approached Raja, she laid her soft feathers across his hand and looked into his eyes as if she could see into his soul. The value you have seen in Kaura has fueled your desire 
to achieve it. It is an honor to have assisted you. Raja M. Tanaus, farewell, man of hope. She flapped her wings and flew away. The group was sullen as they made their journey across the island. Raja couldn't help but think every step he took, Damien and Akan were taking steps in the direction, opposite direction. Raja understood it was their choice, understood he couldn't force them to do anything, but their choice still caused a pain in his heart he wished he could wipe away. At first, Liam and Sydney tried to strike up a conversation with him, but Raja's sullen mood spread to them, and the group was silent as they made their way through the marshes. Every place they left seemed to be mocking reminder of Damien and Akan. They passed through a marshy area, and it reminded him of the crazy time he, Damien, and Akan went through Rahasi Pass with Mima and Lima on the Island of Awareness. It was insane, but he couldn't help but smile at the memory before the pain of their loss hit and he looked away. He focused instead on the compass, hoping for some comfort from Respa as he looked at it. The trees grew denser as they walked on until they could barely see a few yards ahead. Raja's eyes glazed over. He felt the tears coming before he could process them. The truth was he was going to miss his friends. They had grown a lot on this journey and he didn't know what he was going to do in their absence. Sydney and Liam were here, but they were still strangers to him. Somehow they were going to have to, to work together. The group still didn't talk as they got deeper into this tropical forest. Raja was the first to break the long silence. Stay close, it's easy to get lost in here. The canopy was so thick above their heads, it seemed to turn daylight into night. Raja, do you want to talk? Sydney asked. Raja purposely did not look at her. No, we need to focus on our journey. But I think you do. Damien and Akan were your friends. I know it hurts, but please, Raja said, I'd rather not talk right now. We need to get through this. Maybe we need to get through this by talking about what just happened. Those guys are your friends. I very much doubt you think so little of them that you're going to forget them as soon as they walk away. Raja pressed his lips tightly together, staring up at the trees he could see ahead of, of him to keep him from looking at Sydney. I'd rather not talk about it right now, please. Sydney wasn't about to drop it. She opened her mouth to say something when they both heard a loud slap. They turned and saw Liam with an open palm flat against his arm. He looked at them both with a guilty expression. Sorry, he said. He lifted his palm to reveal a squashed mosquito. He made a face full of disgust before wiping the blood on his cloak. Now that Raja was pulled out of his reverie, he heard the distinct sound of mosquitoes. Many, many mosquitoes, several mosquitoes flew around them both, causing Sydney to swat randomly in the air. Raja tried to wave his hand in front of his face to deter the swarm of mosquitoes heading right for his face. Let's get out of here. Sydney and Liam didn't need to be told twice. They picked up the pace and headed out of the mosquito infested area. The mosquitoes left them alone after a while. Raja started to feel an ache deep in his muscles that he was trying to shake. I don't feel very well. Is anybody else hot? Liam struggled to form the words as he wiped sweat from his face. Sydney's eyes glazed over and she tried to rub her vision clear. Raja found himself quite cold and tried to rub the feeling back into his fingers. Why couldn't he feel his fingers? Come on, we've got to keep moving. Raja turned to make sure his new friends were behind him when he noticed they had fallen behind. Sydney, Liam, he heard a loud, all too, all too familiar buzzing noise right, headed right for his face. A giant mosquito landed on his neck and bit him. He swatted it and examined his palm with confusion. He'd never seen mosquitoes this big before. They couldn't be dangerous, could they? As though in answer, Liam leaned over a tree stump and vomited. Sydney stumbled through the forest as the trees spun. She reached out to steady herself. She grabbed the branch of a thick old tree, but it was a foot away from where she thought it was, from where she thought she was seeing it, and she fell to her knees. Raja's face and eyes slowly turned blood red before he lost consciousness 
and tumbled to the ground. A loud buzzing rang through his ears and forced Raja awake. At first, he thought it was the mosquitoes who had come back again, and he tried to lift a weary hand to swat them away. But there was something different about the buzzing. It wasn't as high-pitched as he thought. His blurry vision came back into a sharp fo focus, and he saw a colony of bees. They flew around Raja's face, leaving nectar in the corners of his mouth. Eat, Raja, eat, he heard one of the bees say. He wasn't sure which one it was, but he was too exhausted to fight. Raja slowly licked his lips and he felt strong enough to lift his hand and brush the leaves from his face. They must have fallen on him after his tumble. Raja tried to sit up, but he didn't want to risk the little strength he had left. Raja saw the largest bee hovering close to his eyes. You're awake. Very good. What? What happened? Raja struggled out. The mosquitoes in our forest carry a terrible fever, but our nectar has strong healing properties, and you will be well soon, the bee said. And my, my friends, Raja asked. The bee nodded. We treated them, but they cannot travel yet. They lie not far from here. You all need some rest. The nectar is fast, but not that fast. What Raja tried to raise himself, and the bee moved toward Raja's chest as though he could reach out and keep him pinned to the ground. No, no, you must not try to move. Raja looked up at the sky and clenched his fists, feeling helpless and powerless. You're angry, why? asked the bee. Raja glared at the bee. You should know why, these mosquitoes will be everywhere on this island. How are we possibly supposed to get through if they make it so incredibly, if they make us so incredibly weak? They do not come near us, the bee said. Well, great. Are you going to follow us through the rest of the island? Because that would be great. Why don't other guides just follow us? Why can't they all be with us all the time? I'm so tired. I hate being alone. I've traveled through so much only to be momentarily stopped by some tiny mosquito. The bee once again flew over and hovered by Raja's face. Ah, but the important thing to remember is it's only momentary. Raja tried his hardest not to glare at the bee, but mosquitoes will be everywhere, right? The bee nodded. That's right. Raja groaned. He couldn't help but feel silly arguing with the bee. He felt strong enough to prop himself up on his elbows and did so in order not to argue anymore with this guide. He took a deep breath before sitting up completely. He buried his head in his hands before taking a deep breath and letting it out. He dropped his hands. I'm sorry, I should be thanking you. What is your name? Raja asked. I am Waiwau of the bees that live in this forest. Waiwau landed softly on Raja's shoulder. But you did not answer my question. Why are you angry? I already told you, those ridiculous mosquitoes. I never thought I'd be brought down by such a small thing. Raja felt so exhausted. It wasn't that he could barely sit up. It was the mental exhaustion that he felt weigh heavily on his mind. Waiwau shook his head. Your judgment is being clouded. Raja felt a muscle in his jaw twitch. Clouded? Is this because I'm feeling angry? At Raja could bring, couldn't bring himself to say it. It hurt too much to think about it. Come on, Raja, Waiwau said. Go ahead, let it out. Raja fought down the strong urge to swap Waiwau away like a mosquito. All right, fine. I'm angry. I'm sad. I'm hurt. Damien and Akan left. I know it was their choice, but I can't. Can't help but think I failed them somehow. Just like I failed to protect Sydney and Liam from these mosquitoes. What if I can't do this anymore? What if I fail them too? I don't know if all this suffering is worth it anymore. Raja covered his mouth, hot tears burning down his cheek. His fists were still clenched. Wai Wow lifted off Raja's shoulder and moved to his face. Close your eyes and take a deep breath. Raja furrowed his brow. What? Trust me. Raja sighed, still tinged with anger toward Wai Wow and who he represented, but he found himself obeying anyway. He filled his lungs and slowly let the air out again. You are lost, Raja, Wai Wow said. Raja frowned. No, I'm not. I've been using the compass this entire time. Not physically, I mean mentally. What happened to your friends was tragic and it's hurting you. You will find time to grieve but right now you need to refocus mentally. Raja brought his knees up to his chest. He knew why Wow was right. 
He had been so torn by what happened that his mind was all muddled. Waiwai landed on Raja's knee and began pacing to and fro. Now, what you, now, what do you want to do? I want to reach Kaura, Raja said almost by instinct now. Why? Waiwai asked. I, it took Raja a moment to answer, because it's a land of freedom and integrity where everyone is free to rise and become who they truly are. Raja's eyes flashed with conviction and he felt what little anger he felt float away. Why wow, wow nodded. When would you like to go to Kaura? Raja rubbed his chin in thought. I'm already on my way. Why wow smiled as he continued to pace back and forth. With a journey like this, you must recommit yourself every time the journey gets tough. You had a little setback now. You admitted it yourself. So I shall ask again, when would you like to go to Kaura? Raja flexed his fingers and wiggled his toes to see how much of his strength had returned to his body. He breathed in deeply. As soon as my friends are well enough, we shall be on our way again. What do you think, Wai Wow? Will the nectar bring our strength back tomorrow morning? Wai Wow nodded. Oh, most definitely. Now, final question. Wai Wow lifted himself up again, hovering between Raja's eyes. How will you get to, wow, to Kaura? As you said, the mosquitoes are infesting this island and it will be difficult to outrun them. Raja didn't have an answer for that. He felt his mind start to panic again and closed his eyes. He took another deep cleansing breath. As he did so, he heard a roaring sound. When he opened them again, he saw trees reaching up to the sky above him, their long trunks firm and unbending. He smiled. There's a river I just heard. I will build another boat to travel on the river through this island fast enough to protect us from these mosquitoes. I, Wai Wow asked. Raja looked around at all the bees in the colony working together. We, he looked over at Sydney and Liam who were waking up themselves and doing their best to get their strength back, taking the nectar the bees were giving them. We will build a boat, Raja said. It seems to me, if you know the what, the why, the when, and the how, then you already know what you should do. You just have to do it. Why well, um, why well almost saying he was so proud. Raja's smile broadened, broadened. It was a long day. Raja felt antsy, hoping to get working right away. But he stayed true to Wai Wow's counsel and waited until tomorrow morning. The bees carefully nursed Raja, Sydney, and Liam back to help. When they could finally get up and walk, they got close to each other and reached out with shaking weak hands to grasp each other. It was a minor setback, they all admitted, but were grateful with what Respa had provided. They got busy with Raja's plan. Wai Wow, Wai -Wow led Raja to a place in the hills where he began to dig for ore. They worked as hard as they dared on, with their new strength. They knew they were still weak, but something about having a firm plan in mind brought about a sense of strength from deep inside them. As the days stretched on, Raja found his mind lingering on Damien and Akan's memories less and less. Having a boat to build took most of his attention. At nights, he was too tired to think on them. Instead, thinking about the boat and what else needed to be done on it. He admitted having a few memories of them, especially while building the boat. He remembered the last time they'd built one and how hard he and Damien and Akan worked on it. They would grumble and complain, but Raja couldn't deny the pride in their eyes once it was done. Those memories brought a smile to his face. There were other times when he thought about Losapa and the possibility of him running into Damien or Akan. His palms would get sweaty and he felt overwhelmed with fear and sadness. He'd usually set down his tool, rub his head and remind himself again of their plan to get to Kaura. He knew Respa would provide for them, for him, Sydney and Liam. So he had to believe that even though Damien and Akan had stopped their journey, Respa would still look after them as they remained on the islands. The group worked on the boat together, each doing different jobs. There were definitely plenty of jobs to keep them busy. busy. Sydney worked bellows made from their cloaks as Liam poured the hot metal into molds made of clay. Raja used their newly formed ax to chop down the most durable trees. Sydney stripped the trees of their bark and limbs. Liam and Raja worked a two-man saw back and forth to cut out planks. Sydney sanded the planks and the men nailed them together with wooden pegs. 
The friends proudly admired their finished work. It was much lighter than the last boat and just large enough for three. Liam smiled and wiped his forehead. It looks amazing. Well done, everyone. Sydney laughed. It's beautiful. I guess this means we'll be on our way. Raja, Raja turned to see Waiwau hovering again by his ear. Come, there's something I'd like to give you. Raja followed Waiwau a ways through the trees until he came to the hive. Waiwau landed on a chunk of wax that Raja could easily fit in his fist. You shall travel down the river about 20 miles before you are free of the mosquitoes. Please take this nectar just in case something were to happen. Raja took the ball of wax tenderly and held it close to him. Thank you, Wow. This is a precious gift. He studied it closely. It didn't seem like much, but he knew Wow Wow and the other bees worked hard to get him this much nectar. It's always good to have a clear plan, Wow said with a smile. The bee flew over and settled again on Raja's shoulder. I know you miss Damien and Akan. They were good friends of yours, but stick to your plan and Respa will provide. Raja smiled. You have renewed me. Thank you, Wow for everything. Wow buzzed his goodbye and flew away. Raja quickly returned to Sydney and Liam, holding the precious nectar close. Come, we must go now. They pushed the boat into the fast-moving river and clambered aboard. With the roar of the river, Raja couldn't hear the soft whine of the mosquitoes trying desperately to get to them. The loud snoring of the two men broke the still of the night. Raja and Liam lay side by side next to the boat. Sydney curled up inside within a soft meadow well outside the tropical forest. The river had carried them far and they didn't stop until they were certain they were well out of the way of the tropical forest, which meant they didn't go to sleep until they could see the wide open sky littered with stars. Liam suggested they simply keep going on the boat while they slept. But Raja and Sydney thought it would be best to stop the boat and all of them get a good night's sleep. The river seemed to take them on one path, but they didn't want to chance a split in the river. Beside, they needed their rest. Raja went to sleep trying not to be annoyed that they had spent three weeks working on a boat that gave them a single day's worth of travel. But he remembered the dangerous fever the mosquitoes gave. He'd rather not experience uh, that he would rather not experience again if he could help it. He'd watch the compass tomorrow on their travels and make sure they were still headed in the right direction. The thought of traveling through the island by boat on a river sounded fantastic. The sun was burning on Raja's face when he pried open his tired eyes. He blinked a few times. It had to be almost lunchtime. They had all slept in. He sat up rubbing the sleep from his eyes. Liam shifted around when Raja got up and he too groaned in the bright light. Did we miss breakfast, Liam asked. Does it matter? It seems like it's almost lunchtime anyway. Raja got up and stretched. The boat was still pushed up against the bank of the river. Sydney was fast asleep. Let's eat some lunch and make a plan, Raja said. The three of them pulled some supplies out of their packs and had a hasty and modest lunch. Liam went to pick berries by the forest only to come back quickly and request some of the nectar from Wow. Raja didn't hesitate to give him a few drops. Liam had managed to pick a handful of berries and the three of them quickly ate through them. Raja was thinking about the best course of action when he heard a noise. He looked up, fully preparing to see whatever animal guide striding through to help them, but it wasn't. He didn't see anything for a moment until on closer inspection, he saw a large group traveling right toward them. Raja, Sydney asked as Raja jumped to his feet, Raja frowned, but listened to the feeling in his heart. They needed to go now. Come on, get in the boat. We've got to go, Raja said. Sydney or Liam didn't need to be told twice. They ran to the boat and tried their hardest to push off. It took a few steady pushes before it got easier, and three of them scrambled aboard. Raja watched the group disappearing into this, the distance as the river took hold of them. Raja gave a sigh as he lost track of the group, but it only lasted a moment. He felt the river picking up and looking ahead, he saw quickly moving rapids. Liam backed away. We've got to save the boat. There's no way it can survive those rapids, Liam said. Raja nodded, glad someone else was there to agree with his fears. Try and steer the boat toward the shore. 
Liam got a large pole they had stored in the boat and tried to push against the rocks to steer the boat toward the shore. Raja and Sydney joined Liam to help push the boat. The boat gave a dangerous rock, and if they weren't already focused on trying to push the boat away, they might have stayed on the boat, but instead, with a mighty tumble, all three of them flew through the air and landed in the water. Raja swam vigorously toward the surface and broke through gra gasping for air. Losing no time, he quickly swam to the bank of the river. Liam and Sydney both were doing the same thing. They pulled themselves up onto the bank, gasping for air. Raja watched in dismay as the boat they had built got picked up by the rapids and quickly sailed down the river out of sight. You might have made it, you know. The three of them turned quickly to see a golden giraffe standing a few feet away from them, standing tall and majestic. Raja wiped the water from his eyes. Those rapids are dangerous, Raja tried to convey the danger through his voice, but he was exhausted from fighting the pull of the river. We could have died. The giraffe came closer, leaning his long neck over to see the path of the river. An experienced water boatman could have passed through there easily. You three, there would have been a high chance of survival. Sydney was gasping for air as she glared at this new creature, but there was still a chance we could have died. The giraffe nodded. You are right. The giraffe turned and began to walk away. Raja, Sydney, and Liam all exchanged glances before scrambling to their feet and following the giraffe quickly. What's your name? Raja asked. My name is Stretlet. A pleasure to make your acquaintance. Stretlet didn't stop. He kept walking down the side of the river. You're a guide, aren't you? Sydney asked. I am, Stretlet said. Stretlet's quick responses surprised Raja. Are you guiding us somewhere? Are you still interested in going to Kaura? Stretlet asked. Of course, the three said in unison. Raja couldn't see Stretlet's re reaction to this since his neck was so incredibly long, but their answer seemed to please him. You did not choose to go the path of the rapids, so you must follow me down a different path. Does it involve deadly rapids, Sydney asked. Again, Stretlet didn't say anything, but Raja had the feeling they wouldn't like this path any better. They followed Stretlet through the day, throughout the day and stopped when it was getting dark. It was definitely a long day of walking, but Raja still would rather do this than ride the crazy rapids he saw as they followed the river. He did miss how quickly the river took them though. They could have covered more of the island on the boat than on land. <clears throat> the next day, Stretlet woke them up bright and early to keep moving. Raja was happy to hear no one complaining as they gathered their things, had a quick breakfast and followed Stretlet. Raja could tell Liam and Sydney didn't mind the walk either, but he could sense Stretlet was somehow displeased with them for not choosing the rapids. Stretlet raised his head as far as he possibly could as they approached lunchtime. Raja could believe he had quite the view being up so high. Lunch must be fast, there is danger. Raja frowned, danger? What do you mean? The soldiers are approaching quickly, Stretlet said. Raja didn't argue, they quickly ate their lunch and kept moving. Raja now found himself wishing they had braved the rapids so they could have lost the soldiers that much faster. Why didn't you tell us they were after us, Sydney asked. We could have made better time. Stretlet shook his head. I don't think they would find our trail. I didn't think they would find our trail, but they have, and they're following quickly. Raja frowned, but said nothing. He had to save his strength. They picked up their pace right as, as Raja saw a steep mountain range in the distance. Is that, that's the path you must now choose? Yes, Stretlet finished. Sydney groaned. I'm not sure I can do this. Stretlet nudged his head into Sydney's shoulder. Stretch yourself a little farther, Stretlet said. Your life depends on it. They walked until they reached the edge of a mountainside. A path wound up and around the cliff face. You must climb, Stretlet explained. Distant voices flew to them on the wind, dark and foreboding. dark and foreboding vibrations that sounded like voices. Stretlet frowned. The foy are trying to discourage you, but stay true to what you know. You can do this. You can make it. Raja, Liam, and Sydney began to scramble up the side of the mountain. Stretlet took his long strides, staying behind them to keep them safe. The path was well marked, and Raja had no trouble following it. The whispers started quietly. 
Raja heard them whispering about how pointless this all was, how it was too hard, how Kaura was, must be a made up story to send people to their deaths. There's no way anything could be worth all this trouble. Raja tried his best to keep his mind on the goal, but he couldn't help but think that he would have much rather braved the rapids if he knew he'd have to fight off these foy whispers. He gritted his teeth as he kept climbing. Going up the steep path was treacherous. The added drive to get away from the soldiers and the foy drove them to keep going. You should have gone through the rapids. Raja gasped. His instincts told him that that had that had to have been one of the foy, but it sounded so close, almost like someone was screaming it. He turned to see if one of the soldiers had snuck up on them. And as he did so, he slipped and tumbled. He flailed his arms out to catch something as he tumbled down the side of the mountain. His hand reached and grabbed a branch. Raja, Sydney and Liam both yelled. Hold on, Liam yelled. Raja closed his eyes, feeling sick to his stomach. He didn't stay focused. He didn't do what Wai Wow suggested. He needed to make a plan and stick to it. Liam and Sydney struggled to reach Raja, stretching their hands as far as they could go and try and grab him. Hang on, we're coming, Liam said. One of Raja's hands lost its grip. He closed his eyes, trying his hardest not to panic. Please help me. Stretlet walked forward and surveyed the situation. Found yourself in a little trouble, I see. Stretlet, I'm going to die if you don't help me, please. Stretlet reached out his long neck and caught Raja by the collar. Slowly, he pulled Raja to his feet. You need to stretch a little more to reach your goal, Stretlet said. Arrows started raining down on them. Sidney, Raja, and Liam backed as far as they could away from the against the mountain. Standing upon his thin but muscular back legs, Stretlet used his front hoofs to roll an immense boulder down the mountain path. The one rock started an avalanche, chasing the soldiers back down the mountain and blocking the way. Come, we're almost to the top. The group quickly followed the trail once again and they made it over the top and the foy seemed to recede. Raja grabbed, gripped his knees and took a deep, deep breath. We can rest here, Stretlet said. Liam and Sydney complied, finding a boulder to sit and rest. Raja walked over to Stretlet. I don't think I thanked you for saving my life, Raja said. Stretlet looked down at Raja but smiled anyway. You are welcome, Raja. Despite what you think, I do not wish you dead. Raja fat frowned. What are you talking about? Come now, you act as though I force you into dangerous and onto dangerous and deadly paths. Raja sat down on a boulder next to Stretlet. Well, I guess the thought has come once or twice. You seemed so disappointed we didn't take the rapids. And granted, I understood how, I understand now why we should have, but those rapids could have smashed our boat into a million bits. I'm not disappointed you didn't take the rapids. I know how scary they looked. I just know that the power that comes from stepping out of your comfort comfort zone. Comfort zone, Raja asked. Yes, there's an invisible line that we like to stay in. Stepping out of it can bring about a fear inside of us. But if we push ourselves a little, stretch a bit, the knowledge and experience we gain is more priceless than anything I could physically give you. Raja nodded, trying to process it. But there are some things that really could kill me. I almost fell off that mountain. Absolutely. I doubt you'll be leaping off cliffs anytime soon. Those things are simply dangerous, but sometimes you have to recognize that the walls of your comfort zone can make you think the worst things are going to happen if you try something, and you need to gain the wisdom to look at a situation and say to yourself, this is something I can do. By being able to step out of your comfort zone, you uh, and, then, and then use the skills YWOW taught you to make a plan and commit. Am I making sense, Strutlet said. Raja nodded. Yes, I think I understand. Good, come. I have something to show you. The group got up and walked down the mountain. It was slow going. The last thing any of them wanted to do was slip and slide down the mountain. They took their time, but still pushed themselves to get down the mountain before the sun set. They had a quick dinner as Strutlet talked to the group. Stretlet talked to Liam and Sydney about the thing, some same things he had told Raja at the top of the mountain. They were about to, they were able to talk and laugh some more about wishing they had taken the river rapid route after all. Yes, it probably would have been an easier path, but you learned a lot on this path too. Stretlet said, all you truly, 
all of you truly stretched your limits today and in doing so, learned things about yourself that no one else could have told you. Raja felt himself smile. He realized every path he chose in life gave him the opportunity to learn more about himself. Come, we have just a little farther to go before we rest for the night, Strutlet said. They followed Strutlet, quietly contemplating everything he had taught them as they did so. Strutlet was true to his word. They walked another while before he stopped near a quieter part of the river. The boat, Raja, Liam, and Sydney exclaimed. They headed for the boat that had been pulled in onto the bank by the rapids. Raja quickly inspected it, and even though there were obvious bumps and dents in it, the boat was still sturdy and could easily take them on the river again. You beautiful, beautiful boat, Sydney said as she and Liam helped pull it further onto the bank. This will get us good and far from those soldiers if they ever cross those mountains, Liam said. Raja nodded. He turned to face Stretlet. Stretlet stood there smiling at the group. Raja gave him a quiet bow of appreciation and the giraffe, giraffe returned it. By morning, Stretlet had gone. When we do something the same way every time, we get the same result. Sometimes we have to figure out a completely different way of doing something in order to get the result we need. Nobo is a fish who decided he didn't want to stay in the water all the time, and so he grew some wings and can fly above the water for short periods of time. How do you think Nobo helped Raja and his friends to think outside the box.